Welcome to Mining Over Canada. Join the Canadian Securities Exchange and our partners in a first-hand look into our country's vast mining landscape. I am uh, truly honoured and pleased to be joined this afternoon by Jerry Asp as part of the CSE's Mining Over Canada uh, month at this point. For those of you who have been following along, over the course of the next four to five weeks, we will be interviewing more than 60 people involved with the mining industry in Canada and producing hours of content designed to help the mining industry showcase its development, its challenges, and its opportunities as we move forward. I am delighted to be joined by Jerry Asp this afternoon. Jerry is, uh, I believe, joining me from Whitehorse uh, in the Yukon Territory today. Yeah. Is that correct? That's correct. Uh, and of course, everybody wants to know, It's uh, it's been an early winter in a lot of parts of Canada this year, especially uh, Western Canada. Uh, is there going to be a white Halloween? Well, we already have six six inches, eight inches of snow out there, and it's been down at minus 18 in Whitehorse, and it's been minus 27 up in Beaver Creek, so it's a little chilly. <laughs> and, uh, and a little early, I think, uh, no? It is. It is for... Minus 18 is a little early for Whitehorse. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, again, um, Jerry uh, has uh, been a good friend of the Canadian Securities Exchange and uh, many of our folks over the last uh, several years. I had the pleasure to meet uh, Jerry uh, at uh, PDAC uh, over time, uh, courtesy of uh, our friend and uh, mutual colleague, uh, Mark Francis. And uh, I've uh, been learning about Jerry's story in greater detail. Uh, over the last uh, uh, week or so. And uh, we really have, uh, and, and, and these sorts of uh, terms get thrown around Jerry way too often, but uh, uh, a living legend. Uh, 2020 has uh, been kind of tough for lots of people, but uh, every time you turn around, Jerry, somebody's giving you an award. Um, so I noticed that uh, you were uh, an, an inducted into the Canadian Mining Hall of Fame uh, in January this year. And... Yeah. Uh, I, I enjoyed your uh, induction speech uh, a, a great deal. You were also named uh, the Man of the Year by the Mining Association of uh, British Columbia. I think the proper term is Mining Person of the Year. Uh, I, 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 was a, I was a little disappointed to see that it was the Man of the Year on the press release, but yes, indeed. And uh, you have a long history of uh, recognition uh, from, from the industry uh, for your contributions to reconciliation uh, between uh, Canada's First Nations and the mining industry with a view to creating opportunities for development, education, employment uh, for uh, Canada's uh, First Nations uh, communities. Jerry, uh, I need to stop talking and I need to let you start uh, telling some stories here. Uh, you, you were born in 1948 in uh, northern British Columbia. Uh, you joined the industry. Let's talk about your early years. Well, I started, I got too smart to go to school when I was 16, so I went to work in the diamond drills because I was a big man. I was already six foot two, 175 pounds, and they liked big, strong guys. So I started working on the diamond drills, and from there I went underground and learned to be an underground miner, and and um, and I went to, I got married when I was 19, 20, I got married, and then uh, moved to Carmack in the Yukon and went underground in Santa Cruz Youth Coal Mine for seven years and then got tired of working in 40 below weather outside and, and scorching heat in the summer and so I went back to school and studied project management and project development and went on to start the Teltan Nation Development Corporation in 1985 with yep. my nation the Teltan. So, Jerry, just uh, before we go on to that, and that's, of course, an, ex an extremely important uh, development, the, what people don't, I think, understand uh, is how difficult underground work is. It's backbreaking. It's dangerous. Uh, and, the, and, and the men, and it was all men in those days, wasn't it? All, uh, all men. Were, yeah, no really have to have each other's backs at all time for for safety and uh, and and, uh, and and security, right? It's it really is a very very difficult job. Absolutely, absolutely. Back in the day when I first started, you know, mine safety wasn't the greatest, but the fact that the young 
um, the mining engineers, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, their children started to work in the mining industry. And what happened was they would come home and say to their mother, they'd say, you know, mom, where I'm working, this is not right. It's dangerous in there and blah, blah, blah. And so she'd tell her husband, hey, you know, where Johnny's working, that's not very safe. Somebody better do something about it. And you know, today, mining industry is the safest heavy industry in Canada, 10 times safer than logging, simply because of those uh, young people being hired in the mining industry. It wasn't the old miners, etc. people like me who did it. It was those young people going back home and saying to their mother and dad, this is not safe. And they would come and check it out and say, you're right, it's not safe. And they changed it. Yeah. And I'm very happy about that. Uh, my own, my grandfather uh, was uh, with uh, Falconbridge uh, oh, yeah. in the uh, uh, 50s and 60s and uh, uh, was an operations manager. And he explained to me that it didn't matter how much begging I did, he would never, ever, ever let me go underground. <laughs> <laughs> I loved underground. <laughs> nobody bothered me. You just go there and do your job and nobody bothered you. No bosses, nothing. Just go do your work. <laughs> and... Uh, so, as you say, you uh, uh, got tired of the uh, heat in the summers. Uh, uh, oh, and one other thing. Um, when you were in the uh, the camps uh, doing uh, drills and, and surveys, uh, were you using helicopters by then, or was it uh, still canoes and uh, bushwhacking? Well, no, it was, everybody started to use helicopters in those days. A lot of us drive in, drive out. It, it was nothing in those days to just say, go punch a, a road in and, a, a tote road and use that so all of that's changed right absolutely and uh any uh, grizzly bear encounters well i i was born and raised in the bush i've had lots of grizzly bear encounters <laughs> being from ontario of course our, our bears are a little bit more uh uh docile i guess than the uh, than the grizzlies but uh uh, I know that the the guys working at uh, uh, camps in uh, Ontario and Western Quebec, uh, you still had to have one eye open most of the time for the uh, the bears coming to get your provisions. Oh yeah. Um, <laughs> in any event, so uh, as you say, you uh, uh, moved uh, to back to Telegraph Creek at some point and uh, began working with the local community. I moved back to East Lake. Telegraph Creek is 75 miles from Deese Lake, but Deese Lake is on Highway 37, and so it was the transportation hub in the area, so that's where I moved to. Built a home there and stayed there for over 30 years. And I started the Telcan Nation Development Corporation in 1985, and uh, by 1991, it was the largest native-owned and operated heavy construction company in Western Canada. There's bigger ones now, but we were the biggest in the day. And and the opportunity that uh, describe the opportunity that gave rise to uh, you uh, deciding to put that uh, company together. Well, I was working for the Council for Yukon Indians in Whitehorse as a business service officer in 1984. And in January of '85, the chief, the two chiefs, chief from Iska, chief from Telegraph Creek, and the president of Teltan Central Council came to Whitehorse for meeting with the Council for Yukon Indians. And of course, being a Teltan and those people related to me and, and Ivan Kwok, who was chief of Telegraph, was my chief, uh, met with them and talked with them. And, and and it was in the afternoon, about four in the afternoon, their meeting were just breaking up. And I said, um, what are you guys doing on home? And Ivan said, well, we're going to build the first 10 new modern homes in Telegraph Creek. And I said, who's your contractor? And he said, nobody. So out of the blue, I said, why don't we start a company and build those houses ourselves? So we left. That night, about 7, 30, 8 o'clock, Ivan phoned me and said, Jerry, I want to talk to you tomorrow morning at 7 o'clock at the Yukon Inn. Come on down and we'll talk about this. And I tell people this. I don't know about today, but when the chief back in 85 says he wants to talk to you at 7 o'clock in the morning, you're there at 7 o'clock in the morning. And so I was down there, and I tell everybody, but at least he bought me breakfast. <laughs> so we started talking about this, and, and I told him my idea that I would set up a corporation. This is what I would do. And he said, can you do that? And I said, yes. So they asked me if I would do it, the two chiefs and the president of the central government. So I did it on the side of my desk, set up a corporation for them when I wasn't working for the 
for the Council of Yukon Indians. I put this together. You know, talked to a lawyer, got all the stuff together, and I took it down to Dee Slate. He had called me down for a meeting on April 5th. And I know the date very well because that's my oldest daughter's birthday. And so I uh, said to them, this is what it is, and I called it the Teltan Native Development Corporation. And the chiefs were irate right now. They said, wait a minute here. We're not native corporation. We are a nation. So it became Teltan Nation Development Corporation. And that was the start. We built the 10 houses in Telegraph Creek, and then we went on to build 50 houses in Iskut and 30 more in Telegraph and big band offices and then new health centers. And we did the stuff for, for the Good Hope Lake First Nation. We did work for them built their band offices and houses for them as well. So uh, mm -hmm. we became a prime contract and then built the big health center in Deep Lake as well. So and, that's uh, how we started. And then uh, the uh, uh, in the late 80s, as I recall, uh, there was a real boom in mining development, uh, I guess, in the neighborhood, right? Um, yeah, in the Teltan Territory, that's right. The, the first mining operation that was going in was the Golden Bear Mine. And we had uh, tried to negotiate with them to do the work. We See, the back of our mine, we know we started building houses. We always knew we wanted a heavy construction company because we had a lot of Teltans that were trained in equipment and there were mechanics and heavy equipment operators, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So we, at the back of our mine, we always knew we'd prefer to do that. Mm -hmm. When the Golden Bear Mine went in, and they got permits to build a hundred mile road, 160 kilometer road into the Golden Bear. It had to go right through our community of Telegraph Creek to originally get the equipment and stuff like that through and through our reserve. And we tried to negotiate with them and we were down in Vancouver negotiating with them when they tried to sneak a, about a million dollar worth of equipment into, into the mine site, but they had to go through our reserve. And four women, uh, I won't tell you their names because they get mad when I do, and I, I try to use their pictures, but they won't let me. The four of our Teltan women went down a nice little roadblock and stopped this equipment right on the reserve at Teltan. And so then they phoned us, and we went home. So as soon as we heard, we flew home, and then we took over the negotiation with roadblock. And this was on a Monday. On a Wednesday, they were still not talking. So I told the media that I said, we, we're not going to fool around. I said, this equipment is cluttering up our reserve. So on Saturday morning at 10 o'clock, I'm going to hold a Teltan only auction and sell all this stuff, this junk and get so they can take it off our reserve. <laughs> so by Friday at three o'clock in the afternoon, I had an agreement. <laughs> so that was the start of our, our, our heavy construction company. After we, we first, we negotiated agreements on the, road itself and then we negotiated a three-year upgrade and maintenance contract and in and after once those were in place in 10 days i bought three million dollars worth of heavy equipment in 1988 mm -hmm. and that was the start of the teltan heavy heavy uh, construction division and there were more projects to come i think uh, in the area right um, well uh, the thing about it is you know, being being young and being a native contracting company, the thing that you hear an awful lot is track record. Where's your track record if you want to do contract with the mine? And they weren't weren't happy about giving us contract. We wanted the settling pond contracts and we wanted the open pit mining contracts and we wanted all this stuff and they said, Well, we can't do that. We can let you do all of the earthworks and all this stuff. So we said, that's fine. So we went and we got a joint venture partner, Grant Stewart Construction from Watson Lake. And truth be told, he had what, what we didn't have. He had a track record and he also had good foremans and good superintendents. And we knew him from before and a lot of our Teltan people had worked with him because he, he originally started in, back in Cassiar in 1957. So he was there for a long time. Mm -hmm. Or sorry, in 67. So he was there for a long time. And so the Teltans knew him not only knew him and his company and his people, but they were a, a bona fide company that we could work with. So we set a joint venture and we negotiated an agreement to do the settling fund contract and we negotiated a five-year open pit mining contract. And as they say, we never looked back from there.
And I think uh, you, you've spoken on this many times, but talk about the impact on immediately, I guess, on the employment levels uh, in the uh, on the reserve. Well, the thing about it was when we started in 1984, summer and winter, there was uh, 98% unemployment in the winter and 65% in the summer. And by 1989, we had uh, we were putting over $3 million in pure cash in wages into the communities. And that brings up two issues. One is whether your change is good or bad, change brings you an awful lot of headaches and problems. And so the frontline workers in the health, drug and alcohol and stuff were ready to kill me because I was putting $3 million in cash that was available for alcohol and drugs if they wanted to use it for that in the community. But by the same token, our people were no longer on welfare. When I was a chief in 2005 and 2006, I was probably the only band in Canada that had to give my welfare uh, budget. I had to give about 65000 a year back to the government because I couldn't legitimately spend it. And, and I hate giving the government money, but when I was a chief, I had to do that because... Right. We had no unemployment and only people on welfare were single mothers, handicapped, and some elders. That was it. We, we didn't have an employment or, or, a, or a problem. And again, apart with from, as you say, the alcohol and addiction issues, which, uh, you know, frankly, plague all communities, uh, particularly in rural Canada uh, of, of any any kind, Um the uh, I believe that uh, there were spin-off benefits into the education sphere, uh, whether it was formal education or apprenticeships. Uh, I guess you you really focused on on not just as you say the cash benefits, but overall uh, basically trying to improve the uh, prospects uh, for you know for the children of the uh, of the band. When we were negotiating with. Golden Bears people, they were sitting at the table, Homestake Mining. And the mine manager said to us, you know, we think you Teltans are being unreasonable here. And Pat Zerza was chief of the Iska Teltan said, you know, you resource developers are taking away our way of life. We're only asking that you replace it with something equitable. I don't think that's being unreasonable. And the second thing that happened there was we commented to them that you have to develop our people along with our resources or they're going to stay in the ground. And so those two statements changed. That was, that's what all the thinking and all the negotiating in the Taliban nation was based on that kind of thought. How do you develop our people along with these resources? And don't think that we're being a nuisance because we're not. And I think uh, were those arrangements um, I noticed in, in, reading uh, some of your background, uh, the development of what's called an impact benefits agreement? Yeah, we did, we called them the Teltan Participation Agreement. There was only three agreements in Saskatchewan prior to the Golden Bear Agreement. That was the first agreement in British Columbia and the fourth in all of Canada. And mainly it was a socioeconomic agreement targeting employment training and contracting. But the contracting was big because that's what gave us the opportunity to set up our development corporation in a real way and bring in heavy equipment and start that division. And that's since become a model for many other agreements that uh, have been negotiated uh, with the industry, right, Jerry? Yeah, and, I, and some people call me the grandfather development corporation. TNDC, the Teletown Nation Development Corporation, was one of the first real development corporations set up in Canada to work with the industry. Now, uh, uh, somebody who's again here from Ontario, uh, where I think the uh, majority, if not the, all of the province, is uh, governed by treaty. Um, and then I guess the farther west you go, the less uh, land you see that has that has been resolved or settled by treaties. Is there a difference in uh, working with the uh, local communities? Big difference. Back in nineteen. 19- Back in 1985, 86, 87, there was no such thing as Aboriginal rights and titles enshrined in the Constitution. The Constitution was signed in 84, but and they said uh, Aboriginal rights shall be hereby acknowledged and affirmed, but it didn't spell them out. So we didn't right. have them. 
in our back pocket. It was just said they, they were recognized. And so we said, this land is ours. The Teltan wrote a declaration in 1910. And uh, we said, this is our country. And we're willing to talk to you. We're willing to deal with you on a fair basis. And we send it to the crown. And we send it to the king in England. And uh, as my brother said in a meeting, he said, you know, I know the mail is slow, but this is ridiculous. They haven't given us an answer yet on our declaration. So anyway, that was our thought. So, so we just simply said it was our land and you, you have to deal with it. That's why we had to have a nice little roadblock. And then we convinced the government that uh, it would be wise to work with us because the environmental stuff was just coming on stream in a bigger way. And where they were operating is the Salmon River. They wanted to go up to Teltan, which is 100% of the food fish of the Teltan people come from the Teltan River. So we were adamant that they weren't going to butcher that country and, and do it willy-nilly. And in fact, we rerouted that road and in 1989. We received the environmental award for the province of British Columbia for rerouting that road. So I tell people, if we're, it wasn't just money that the Teltans were after. We protected our land at the same time and our resources. Right. I think I've seen you uh, uh, with some pretty nice salmon on the uh, shoreline of uh, possibly the Stikine. I'm not sure. Yeah, it was but uh, you, you have a you have a famous saying, I believe, about uh, about uh, fishing. The two, uh, wait, what is it? If oh. uh, you, you need, oh, yeah. yes, yeah, okay. You know the, you. The, the saying that people. I talk. This is about my economic development philosophy. They say if you give a man a fish, you feed him for a day, but if you teach him how to fish, you feed him for a lifetime. So I've taken that one step further with my economic uh, stuff that I, I talk about around the world. I say, no, you got to teach him to catch two fish, one to eat and one to market, so he can buy the amenities everybody else gets. <laughs> so that's what I do now. I teach them how to catch that second fish. And I think you talk about, uh, you know, the Taltan having a heritage of, of trading. Uh, so on that second part, that uh, uh, whether it was uh, engaging with uh, uh, other uh, First Nations and uh, then the Russians and the Europeans uh, who were uh, fur trading uh, in the northern British Columbia and the Yukon, uh, but the, the Taltan always uh, stood out as uh, uh, particularly adept uh, traders and uh, and business That's partners. <laughs> That's correct. I, I used to tell people, you know, the Taltan has been mining for 10,000 years. And then my sister is an archaeologist, and she was down on the Prince of Wales Island off the coast of Wrangell, Alaska. And they found a cave. And they went in there, and there was a body in there, and there was uh, 38 obsidian artifacts. And the body was carbon dated to 11,400 years. And every single obsidian artifact came from Ice Mountain, which is in the center of Teltan territory, where we mined obsidian. So now I tell people, you know, I used to say we were mining for 10,000 years. Well, really, I lied. We were mining for at least 12,000 years. So, but it's true. We were the, we traded first with the Russians and we traded with the Spaniards. Uh, people didn't know that the Spaniards came up and traded up as far as Wrangell, Alaska, and, and in the Haida, and then in the Prince Rupert area. And the Teltans traded with them there. The Teltans were among the first to have guns. We traded for guns. And because they wanted our jade, gold, and our furs. And our biggest trade, of course, was with the, the Tlingit from Alaska and the other tribes. And also they came all the way from Fort St. John, the Beaver Indian from Fort St. John and the Creek came as far as Telegraph Creek to trade with us because we had dry salmon, dried soap berries, and, and uh, the Clinkets really wanted our goat hair because their goats have hair about four inches long, but in the winter, the Teltan goats have hair over eight inches long. And so that was highly prized. The goat wool was really highly prized for their rugs and stuff. So that was our trade commodities, and we were a middleman as well. We traded and took all these, and we traded inland with the Kaskas and moved north up into the Ross River country and all the way up into the Dene people in Northwest Territories and the Han up in Dawson City even talked about the Teltan. And we can prove that our, our obsidian trails, as we called them, went south, and uh, there's, there's been the Teltan obsidian found in Florida, but a lot of the 
obsidian was found in uh, Minnesota. And uh, so the Minnesota Institute has a lot of our artifacts, but you can fingerprint it and, and know exactly where that obsidian came from. So the obsidian from the Ice Mountain was a very special obsidian because it was fractured for 11 inches. So you could end up with an 11-inch knife. Right. And so it was really highly prized by the Aboriginal people all around the world, all around North America. So we that so, that's uh, our background, trading, business and, and, and trading. Yeah. Yeah. That's uh, that's fascinating, Jerry. Thank you. Um so so with the uh the the Bear Creek uh project uh underway and uh you know the, the money uh coming into the uh coming into the band, um yeah. you then uh I guess took your skills uh, beyond Telegraph Creek and uh, began to work with uh, other uh, Aboriginal groups in Canada. And uh, over the last few years, you've been uh, working on a global scale uh, with Indigenous peoples um, and uh, building bridges uh, to uh, to the resource industries. Um, can you talk a little bit about that work and uh, where where some of the places it's taken you to? Yeah, just. When we started the Teltan Nation Development Corporation, I think we had one high school graduate. Last year, we graduated 48 students. And we have I, we have five uh, engineering students right now. We had we had a, graduated our first uh, mining engineer. We have chemical engineers and other engineers and whatnot, but we, we graduated our first mining engineer a year ago in May. And we have five more students there now, and and even today, since 2005, the Teltans have had no unemployment in our nation. Any person who wants a job has a job, or is in an accredited training program, or or an apprenticeship program, or in college or university. So we're pretty proud of that coming from. And so in essence, we broke the welfare culture, the Teltan Nation forever. They will never go back. And so that's one of the big things that the Teltan people are very proud of, that we brought our pride and dignity back to our nation. Yes. But working with other groups, I have, in uh, about seven years ago, I was a vice president of the Canadian Aboriginal Minerals Association. I started this foundation with Hans Matthews back in 1990. And then for 23 and a half years, I was the vice president. And then I resigned to do other things. And uh, I met a, a lawyer who was working in Vancouver, and she spoke fluent Spanish and had been working down in South America, Central America, on mining and indigenous issues. And when I talked to her and I gave her the book, uh, Aboriginal Toolkit for Mining, that I helped write and develop with Natural Resources Canada, I said, here's some required bedtime reading for you tonight and talk about it tomorrow. And I told her that I helped develop that and we got talking and she decided that we should set up an organization called the Global Indigenous Development Trust and to become uh, working with Indigenous people around the world to tell my story. And so that's one of the things I do now. And Natural Resources Canada has also invited me around. So I've been Australia and New Zealand and, and um, Philippines and it's up to Sami people in Sweden and Norway. I was foolish. I went up there on the 27th of December, uh, January, and I'll never do that again. I almost froze to death in Lulio. <laughs> so, um, because I thought I was tough and I was just wearing my leather jacket and I almost froze to death. <laughs> anyway, and my grandfather came from Vestero, Sweden. So I went and I talked at a major, major project conference in Stockholm. In, in Stockholm. And uh, Vestra is only about 100 kilometers south. So I, when I told the people my grandfather came from there, some of my cousins, my grandfather's brothers and sisters' kids came to visit me. So it was a great time visiting a Swedish relative that I never knew. <laughs> but anyway, my, uh, well, my, my, Swedish, my Swedish relatives are about a thousand, uh, a thousand years uh, different on the family tree. But <laughs> as yeah. you can see, the, uh, the genetics are still there right. and strong. That's right. <laughs> But that's what I do now, and I'm, I'm working around the world with indigenous places. I'm down, down in Peru quite a bit, was down in Peru quite a bit on the big Hud Bay project, Consancia project in Hud Bay, and also down with the Shuar people in Ecuador. And right now I'm working with the, the, the Grafna people in Belize, Honduras, Nicaragua, 
and uh, we haven't talked mining yet, but for sure we will uh, over the next two or three months, I'm sure. And, and the issues are, are common, aren't they, in, in common. many parts of the world? Very common. You know, and like I, I helped write the Engineers Road Borders, I helped write their document on procurement from mining. I helped write their report on that. So I, that's the kind of stuff I talk about now when I talk with mining companies about how to uh, work closely with indigenous people and how to work with the site. I understand Rio Tinto got himself in real trouble in Australia a short, short while back by blasting a, a heritage site. Um, I also sit on Newmont's Aboriginal Advisory Board now, and they certainly, one of the things we talked about at their last meeting the other day was we want to make sure that we don't end up with a problem like happened at Rio Tinto. And I said, yeah, well, as long as I'm sitting around, you won't. So, <laughs> I'm sure that's right. Well, and I think that that's that that does raise the issue that um, I think to be a, a a successful mining company in this day and age, um, you absolutely have to engage uh, because so so often uh, the the minerals are um, located on uh, traditional lands uh, of Aboriginal peoples all over the world. And uh, unless you successfully engage with those people to help them share in the benefits and to address the social issues uh, that uh, uh, we see around the world, uh, you're not going to necessarily have a successful project. Um, in Canada, you know, I dealt with the mining companies a long time. I was negotiating with them in 97. And I'd go to them and I'd say, make a deal with me. And I guarantee no government in their right mind would be to an agreement between a First Nation and a mining company. And the government were going behind my back saying, don't listen to those Indians, they don't have any rights, don't worry about it. So on December the 7th, when the Dalgamuk case came down, the Supreme Court of Canada said that Aboriginal rights and title are hereby affirmed in the Constitution. In January, when I talked to the mining company, I said, you thought I was hard to deal with last month. I said, now i got a Supreme Court decision in my back pocket. Yeah, read this. <laughs> but the problem is no, that, with the yep. third world countries is what happens is the mining companies, especially in the remote areas, become the de facto government. They have the stores, they have the transportation, they have their hospitals, they have everything. And so uh, that's where the big problems come in because they in essence run everything and the indigenous people when their indigenous people try to assert rights there's some serious serious problems happening i seen it in, in in peru when i was there i seen it in a couple mining properties didn't happen in the constancia because constancia had some had babe hired people like me and others to come down and talk and and help mitigate the problem before they started but that's one of the problems is because the First Nations and, and, the, and the mining company in essence becomes the de facto government. Right, right. So uh, I'd like to uh, unfortunately start to uh, wind the conversation down. I've got two more areas I want to cover. Um, okay. The first one is, uh, it, you know, Jerry, you almost always wind up in positions of leadership. Right. Uh, whether it was uh, when you were underground, you were the uh, president of the union local, uh, mm -hmm. you, you led the mine safety team, uh, mm -hmm. you, you were a band chief, um, and you have founded numerous organizations and uh, uh, are recognized uh, as, as a leader uh, in your community, uh, you know, throughout Canada and a visionary in the mining space. What what uh, what is it? Were you, were you born? Uh, with the kind of, of uh, presence of mind that uh, people follow you, or what what leadership skills uh, do you have you honed, and and what have you learned? What can you pass to 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 aspiring leaders? My grandfather was the last true hereditary chief of the Teltan people. To become a chief of the Teltan people, there are two clans: the Wolf Clan and the Crow Clan. I'm from the Wolf Clan, and uh, only the crows can be chief. Okay, so I'll tell you how the chief was elected and, and put in place. It was handed down, and you became what they call the nonok. It's like a title, it's like being same king. Anyway, to become the nonok, 
when the Nanak, who is a crow, marries, you always have to marry the opposite clan, so you marry a wolf. And since a wolf can never be chief, your children can never be chief. So what you do is you take your oldest sister's oldest son when he's four years old, and you raise him to be the next chief because he's a crow. And so that's what my grandfather happened to my grandfather, Durta. And uh, I spent a lot of time with my grandfather. And uh, he lived his life in a straight line. He was six foot four in his stock and feet, 220 pounds of muscle. And he lived his life in a straight line. And uh, he did exactly what he wanted and, and raised 18 children and built homes wherever he went. He, he didn't rent a house and then he built them, uh, this kind of stuff. And so those are the kind of people that I hung out with. My grandfather asked, came from Sweden and jumped shipping back in Rouge, Louisiana. And he was taking on coal and worked his way up to lumber camps in Wisconsin and then across the continent of Vancouver and came up with a sticking hunting for gold. And that's how he found my grandmother. And so that's the kind of background I have. But I always, I always knew that there was a lot of things wrong with the way the Aboriginal people in, in we call them Indian people in Canada were treated. And so I started working on trying to sort out some of those problems. And I got into what we called the Indian Movement in 1969 when when Trudeau and, and Christian tried to legislate the Indians out of existence and they were going to kill the Indian Act and, and uh, legislate the Indians out of existence. And that's when I got into the what's so-called Indian Movement. And, and I studied leadership and all this kind of stuff. And, and when I went into program, project management, project development, then I had to really do some serious studying and go back to school and do this stuff. So that's where it comes from, from my leadership. But really, my background gave me leadership skills from my grandfather. So your C3 alliance, you talk about community, commitment, and cooperation. Yeah. I uh, worked with them for 10 years or so, and then I retired from them and started the Global Indigenous Development Trust, which is a different focus. And C3 Alliance, I don't work with C3, other than contract work. I still yeah. go back and work with C3 there on contract. But, but I was going to say the, the, the mm -hmm. motto of that organization yeah. does seem to speak to what you, what you were just oh. talking about in terms of leadership that, you know, awareness and pride and community yep. uh, commitment uh, to those people. So as you say, seeing something is wrong and addressing it and cooperating, you know, not just, of course, with the local folks, but, you know, cross the industries and so on to uh, uh, to obtain the benefits uh, for your for your community. When we when we did the C3 alliance and, and, and set it up afterwards, I said, hey, we're crazy, you know, and they said, why? I said, well, we should have called it C4. So I could have said we were explosive operation. C4 is dynamite. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> That's true. It is. So I missed it. <laughs> so we should have called it C4 instead of C3. <laughs> At last, uh, uh, Jerry, uh, you know, as, as, as you look forward, uh, what do you see for the future of, uh, of the mining industry in Canada and uh, relations with, with Canada's First Nations? If I was a young man again, I guarantee I'd get into the mining industry. No question. There's 122 trades, and every single occupation you can name is needed in the mining industry. And die-hard environmentalists can find a place there. The doctor can find a place there in the mining community. Nurse, whatever. You name the profession that's there. And now today, because there's no good, well, I shouldn't say that. There's no real uh, plethora of underground miners. I got, a, I got a guy that's married to my granddaughter who's an underground miner. And mining companies are fighting over him, you know. But and because this pandemic, everybody else is having serious problems. The Teltan people have no problem because the Red Chris mine is operating, the Bruce Jack mine is operating. We have about 40 exploration companies. Skeena Resources have 170 men on the OLSK site. The Teltan are not hurting for employment because of the pandemic when everybody else is, because it's an essential service. 
So right. I would absolutely not number one. I would tell any young person, go get into the mining industry. You'll you'll any career that you want to pursue, it's there. That's number one. Well, Jerry, I can tell you right now, mining companies, uh, there's still a few diehard dinosaurs in the industry, but most people understand now that you have to deal with First Nation communities and 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 companies in their traditional territory with or without treaties if you want to succeed. I think that's a, that is abundantly clear at this point. Jerry, thank you again. Uh, it is a wonderful, a compelling story, and uh, you certainly deserve all of the accolades and more uh, that, uh, that you've received this year and over the last several years. Um, I, I will say our quick story, uh, walking through PDAC with you, reminded me of the times that I had the privilege of walking through PDAC with Ned Goodman. In oh. both cases, people were coming up to you, talking about projects, bringing up some issues that you need to, that they'd like to engage you to assist on. I mean, you're just, a, uh, again, a, 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 a well-known and extremely popular, positive figure for the industry. Uh, Jerry, thanks again for joining us this afternoon. And uh, again, I'm Richard Carlton, and this is Mining Over Canada brought to you by the Canadian Securities Exchange. Thank you. Thank you, Richard.